Okay, we are going live right now. Woo! <laughs> right on. Hey everyone, I am Stan Evans, and thank you for joining us for the North Face Speaker Series. Um, our today, our guest is Angel Collinson, a free skier that caught my eye because of her explosive talent in the mountains. And my curiosity peaked when I heard her as a guest on the 10% Happier podcast with Dan Harris, um, an ABC host. So what caught me was her views on meditation and mindfulness, uh, paint a bigger picture of a human that skiing is just a part of. And let's face it, in the last five years, if you watch a TGR or matchstick flick, you know Angel rips 45 degree slopes like Natalie Portman in Black Swan. So <laughs> yet few understand her consciousness and with which she examines the beauty of the world around her. So today we're gonna find out about it. Angel, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Stan. No, no problem. Um, I am really curious about, I mean, most people know your backstory, but I want to know a little bit about like your influences of getting into skiing and kind of just the outdoor industry and some of your influences from your past, um, women, male neighborhood, just all the things that kind of like influenced you on this path. Yeah. Well, I mean, I grew up up at Snowbird Ski Resort and mm -hmm. I raced until I was 19. So mm -hmm. my first like major hero was Peekaboo Street and she mm -hmm. signed, I had one of those like white round bubble Bori helmets, you know, oh, yeah. and I still have her signature on it. And it was just like this like Peekaboo Street bubble head mm -hmm. for a long time. And then, um, yeah, then it was like Sage Catavrigalosa, fellow mm -hmm. North Face teammate mm -hmm. for a long time. And then mm -hmm. once I started moving into big mountain skiing here at Snowbird, like, a really big influence of mine was Rachel Burks and she just like rips and was so supportive of like women's success. And it was the first time I'd really had a woman be like so happy for my success. Mm -hmm. And she's still one of my favorite people to see you at this day. That's great because for me, obviously being a little bit older, I kind of really identified with like Kim Reichhelm who was in License to Thrill. And then um, Kristen Ulmer was actually like, that was the first, one of my first photos I ever got published in powder was of Kristen Ulmer. No way. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> we went back country camping up in Beehive Basin and did an overnight for powder. Um, and it was funny because we were shooting the next day and I did a rookie mistake and forgot my sleeping bag. <laughs> Cause I was so concerned about all the camping gear. So I had to camp out overnight without a sleeping bag. But we got the shot, it was all good. Um, How do you camp, oh wow. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, no, it was like a super ramp, but it was summertime, so it wasn't as bad as it sounds. Don't, don't make it like a, a um, it wasn't a tragedy. <laughs> but it kind of was, that was kind of like my first perk and interest in seeing women who really ripped because like they were really good. And honestly, having that personal connection of meeting Kristen and going and shooting with her, like she was so solid and such an interesting human being. And like um, seeing that perspective really changed the way I saw perspective as, as far as like women in outdoor sports. And so for me, it kind of started me on this path of just exploring that. And it really didn't come to fruition for me until probably like 2009, I produced a film, a women's snowboard film called Stance. And then in 2010, I produced a women's ski film and directed um, a women's ski film with Greta Eliasson called Say My Name. But really the catalyst for just looking into these women's perspectives and things like that was really my sister. So my sister was a broadcast journalist. And when I was in college and kind of started in photography, like there were a lot of people who were naysayers about me going into that field and doing those type of things. And my sister was a big proponent. She was a super advocate of like doing what you need to do. She was like a very strong willed woman who was like, Stan, like do what do you like make sure you do what you do and when she passed on like she was killed by a drunk driver while i was just finished up with, with college that will almost kind of kicked it into overdrive of like doing me you know doing what i need mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. and kind of looking into that kind of space and then also helping those around me who were trying to go and do them you know like doing themselves and so it was a really interesting thing of coming to those parts and working in those women's ski films so I wanted to ask you a little bit about like working in larger productions and kind of how you felt as the woman in that place and, and, and your role and how you go about doing that. 
Yeah, well, it's really cool hearing you talk about like your history in the sport because it was like before I came onto the scene. And so I got to come onto the scene in the big world, you know, like the big production world with TGR and Matchstick. And like I got to step onto the foundation that the women who came before me built along with you, you know? And so yeah. it's like there was so much work going on behind the, or not behind the scenes, but like before I even knew about it that I got to reap the benefits of. And so, you know, we were talking before the show of like how grateful I am and how cool it's been to chat with you because like there's so much that goes into building a sport up to what it is and into like creating opportunities for people and, you know, now, even in the past, like seven years, there's so many more women in the big productions and in the big ski movies. And mm -hmm. I've always loved um, being, well, I guess I've always loved skiing with guys. And so mm -hmm. being like the only girl on these film trips, um, it didn't bother me. Like I really enjoy mm -hmm. working with men, but there's mm -hmm. a totally different synergy when you have more women in the mix. And also it's like uh, more encouraging for us to be like, oh, she just did that. Like I can do that. I can step it up. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I feel like you have seen that and you know women really well. I mean, you've like, it's really cool talking to you and how much time you've spent like building women up and working on women's projects. And, you know, we were talking about maybe doing a, a snowmobile trip and I was like, Stan, I'm not very good at sledding and you're going to have to dig me out a lot. And you're like, girl, there's nothing I haven't seen. I'm I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of that goes back to respect of the people like Amber Stackhouse, Liam Pelosi, Aaron Comstock. And for me, what I was seeing and kind of thinking, I'm kind of giving a, an aside from this, right? So you're in this super male ego driven sport. And what was interesting is being a guy, I was part of that group, but because I was black, I was still different, right? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Different things of like how I was necessarily like, my opinions weren't taken as seriously or like my voice wasn't necessarily heard. And so if I can imagine that for myself, I could imagine what was happening with women in these production groups or what they're trying to do and kind of achieve. And for me, I was like, it's like, how can I actually like kind of change that? And what was interesting is I actually worked with a guy named Jeremy Miller and Aaron Comstock was the person who actually came to us and, and asked us if we actually wanted to go about making those, that movie. And I had to think about it for like a long time. And, you know, the big game changer for that was my friendship with Gretchen Blyler. So, People don't really realize how influential Gretchen was to women's snowboarding, um, you know, because she was a very, like, a very big deal in women's snowboarding. And at the time, like, she was vying for Olympics. Pretty much every weekend she could go to an X Games or a Grand Prix and, like, come home with a 10 grand check. So for her to, like, step aside from that, like, there was, like, a, a specifically a weekend where I remember – she was filming with us and we have a picture of a picture of watching TV or watching Kelly Clark win. And like, literally like she forfeited that money where she would have gotten top three for sure, you know, easily to come and work on her free riding and, and give women a different outlet to look at it besides contests, because literally that was kind of like the only venue that women could get exposure. And so her signing up because Oakley at the time, they were like, yeah, we won't sponsor the movie unless Gretchen says that she's into it. So literally, I was sitting there on the edge of being like, Gretchen, you're <laughs> not into it. And literally, like, she decided that path and, like, set my career of making that movie because if she wasn't into it and wasn't going to do it, then I wasn't going to do it because I had to go and make a living that way. So because of her, I owe a lot to her in that respect. But then she came out and, like, did all this different free riding and filmed a whole different part and just showed a whole different thing of experience and what was really interesting to me is um, just seeing how her grow. And she talked about how that free ride experience actually made her contest and competition and just her snowboarding better overall. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, interesting aside. But yeah, Gretchen. I know. Well, so many, yeah, so many of these like people that have just built it. Well, and that kind of like what you were talking about the um, the parallels of like mm -hmm. because you were a guy, but you're black. And so you're different. And you saw like the differences that women were experiencing. And you're like, Oh, well, I could help these guys. Cause I can see what's going on. Cause I'm kind of from a slightly removed perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I know we had talked before about sort of the, the concept of like allyship and you've been mm -hmm. like an ally for women's sports and totally made it what it was. And like, I didn't even know that until we started talking. And so like, I just want to thank you for all of that. And 
Yeah, I now mean, like the, go ahead. It, I don't know, it's just, it's funny because it wasn't all about like, like I learned so much from them and I learned so much from the ladies of working with Aaron, working with Kimi Fasani, working with Leanne, working with, like they're all super hard workers. And like, I, like, I learned about them. And like, and it's like, here's the whole thing that's like, what's crazy is like, we're all beginners, right? Like I didn't start off being like this backcountry guru or sledding or thing. Like I had to learn, you know, like, mm -hmm. honestly, like it was really hard. Like, you know, I'm like, it, it sucked. Like, you know, that. so I empathize with that. I'm like, you know, and like showing Kimmy how to sled and showing, it's like, everyone has to start sometime and everyone has to be there and everyone trying to be, do a mentorship in that kind of space of that. And, and again, Gretchen coming out and learning, like when like she had it made, like she was on at and commercials. She was like doing stuff. Like, I mean, she created a whole thing where in that space, she also created a whole women's contest called cover girls that probably people don't even know about a high cut contest specifically for women, you know? And so when you think about it, it opened my mind and seeing that cover girls thing made me think like, we're all kind of doing this thing on this outdoor channel. Right. And it's like, it's like, the badass guy, Lone Wolf Mountain channel, you know, but by hanging out with these women, I realized there's like different channels. People want to mm -hmm. see different channels, you know, like that, like there's the women's channel. There's, there's BET, like black channels. Like it's like, you look at TV now and there's like, there's insecure, there's love path country. There's, um, God, the bachelor. <laughs> the there's blackish. There's the watchman. There's the girls. There's insecure. There's golden girls. You know, like there's all these channels that people want to watch different things. And here's the funny thing about it. When you're a brand and you're looking at how you're going about, these aren't just necessarily art projects that, you know, that are cool narratives for women. These are legitimate ways to show your product to an audience that wants to see it on your channel, you know? So it's the mm -hmm. thing where you're looking at it um, as this is a promotional piece to show your equipment and if you're not giving that, if you're putting it in the guy's movie, you're having limited time for limited space to show women's products, right? But mm -hmm. if you go through your whole channel, all of a sudden you've got a whole channel dedicated to showing women's products, black people's products, handicapped products, LGBT products that all these audiences are craving for. They want to go and turn that TV to different channels. And I think that's where a lot of things in the outdoor world is kind of missing that concept of like, yes, people see these different channels, but they also want to like, you might want to turn over here. You might want to turn over here. You might want to see how you feel. And so for me, it became a thing of like listening to these women, hearing about what they're doing, seeing the different products, and then me creating the channel for them. You know, like mm -hmm. I was onto it really. Like that. they were already doing their own thing and they were doing great stuff and they continued to go do great things past. Like looking back now, like watching Facets and then watching Uninvited, I was just like, these movies are great. It is cool because they made the channels. The channels are there now and like it's just like it's cool to see like that evolution to have it come full circle you know totally so, yeah and it's oh yeah. go ahead no you go ahead well i was just gonna say like it requires um thinking outside of the box you know because to be like oh well, i see this need that's not being met yet mm -hmm. and usually when you go to like say like i'm gonna do this new thing or i see this new need people aren't always receptive right away and so like having the courage in yourself to be like, I'm gonna do this thing. Like I wanna pursue snowboard photography or mm -hmm. I wanna pursue sailing or I wanna do these things. It requires this um, this like conviction in ourselves that we have to build, you know? And I just so see that in you and in your, I like I know that when you come up with new ideas, it's like people and it's and they're if they're radical or they're addressing some gap, usually people aren't like, yeah, that's awesome. Sometimes that happens and that's great. But other times no, people are like, no, <laughs> people yeah. like, what are you doing? No, like what we have is working great. And you're like, yeah. oh yeah, that can be better. So, and maybe it's not working great. And that's the thing where I look at that versus like, we need less gatekeepers. And like realistically what we need is, we need creative incubators that are good at Excel spreadsheets. You know, <laughs> also here's all the thing. All I want to do is like, how I want to come in with a good idea and then have those creative incubators, move around the numbers on the Excel spreadsheet and be like, oh, here's how we're gonna do it. Like, here's how we're gonna go about changing this. Here's how we're gonna go about creating these interesting things. And like like a little bit more of the yes and, and involved in empathetic culture 
of seeing things that way, you know, of like, how can I, how can I help instead mm -hmm. of, you know, you know, like, how can I encourage? And so I'd like to see more of that in the culture where people come up with like, like, there's no, like, people are going to come up with creative ideas and they don't necessarily know how to facilitate them. Right. And this is what you see mm -hmm. it nowadays. People have great ideas. They don't want to facilitate them. But people are so overrun and so used to the way of doing things, they don't stop and think outside themselves and be like, okay, how can I help this person who's not maybe got this fully fledged idea become a full fledged dream? And an mm -hmm. like that. And I'd like mm -hmm. to see more of that of like me, like, okay, how can I help this person who's like, they've obviously got a talent and a gift and thing like that. How can I full fledged and help them achieve their dream? Because that's where it's like, it's like we're trying to achieve dreams, you know? And I think people need to really think about it in that regard rather than always being naysayers. Yeah. And the funny thing about that, like honestly with, with, with Greta's film, like a lot of people didn't really want us to make that film. It was like, we didn't have a great budget, like at the same time throughout the, the thing, like, like there are people who are like, oh, we don't want to do the project. We don't think it, we don't believe it. People didn't believe she was going to go that high and, and set a world record, you know, like, like all the cards were stacked against us, right? But as soon as we built the jump and then Greta went 30 feet in the air, everyone was just like, oh my God, like this is a great thing. And, like, and it was like, it was just one of those things where like literally Jeremy and I believed in Greta. Like mm -hmm. at the time, like that, and I'll say it and I'll say it again. Like at the time, I thought Greta was the best all around female skier, period. She could ride a half pipe, she could jib, she could do big mountain. She could spin at park kickers all around, best female skier all around. Done, you know? And what was funny when looking at that, when people were like, we don't believe in your dream, it was funny because I saw some of the Excel spreadsheets of what the analytics were after after her jump. And so they pushed it out on the press. It had 33 million views in the first month. So it's like, so now looking back, and I'm like looking at my like dream of like watching this and helping Greta achieve her dream. And you're going to tell me that it's worth nothing? I don't think so. Totally. Well, and now, like, you, I mean, that's where I see you as, like, a forward thinker in that you see people, you believe in them, and you support them. And that it's amazing how much um, people's belief in us, like, my closest friend's belief or, like, some of, you know, the women in my life or when I'm out in the field with Sage and Ian, like, them being like, you got this. Mm -hmm. Like, you know your abilities and you got this. Mm -hmm. It has been so fundamental for me to get to where I am. So I just like, I just love so much the opportunities that we have to believe in each other, even when other people don't. And sometimes it's that experience of like, of when you have doubt or when you have people that are questioning you and you do it and you prove it to yourself. It's like, then the next thing that you step up to, you have like three times the confidence in yourself because you're like, I know what I can do even if no one else does. And it's just such a beautiful thing. And those relationships um, of people who help us and support us are just like the best thing in the whole world. For sure. And that actually kind of takes me to my next question of just kind of like mental resilience, right? And so I'm looking at it and I was like, I was like watching your skin, I was reviewing some of your old footage of slopes and i really was amazed at like some of your skiing technique of just like when you get on really steep mountains like that like you initiate your turns with your inside ski and then you're kind of using your like outside ski to really kind of finesse and the way that you can go down in trajectory but then kind of like scrub speed and really come in line it's really like it's a it's a it's amazing watching your skill. Like, it's like you have a distinctive style that's very, like, it's not like, dun, 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 you know, like, you know, like heavy metal, like, that <laughs> it's like this finessing of floating. Like, it's almost just like watching, like, a hummingbird on a slope, you know? <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, it's really finessy and really, like, easy, but watching you know, how you like, negotiate these big lines and get into these entry points and, like, miss these rocks. I like that and just like that comes from also looking at believing in yourself and visualizing and the confidence to be like okay when i get to this point i'm going to do this and when that happens i'm going to go do that and when i get to this turn i'm going to hit it right here and i'm going to hit that ramp and then i'm going to straight line it and i was just like i was like look at you go look at this girl <laughs> like, I 
happened? When I first saw one of your video parts, I was like, who's this girl? <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that you brought that up about like the technique and the finesse mm -hmm. and the inside ski because like, I don't, e I don't even really think about that. It's in my muscle memory. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, that, that is something that I have to do is finesse things differently because I'm like five, four and 120 pounds and I just have to approach things totally differently. But another thing that you mentioned was like the visualizing and knowing and hitting the entry point, knowing when to just like kind of drift straight down and then when to set your edge and cut in and having that like mental map of your line is like the hardest thing ever. But I mean, I raced for gosh, I don't know, until I was 19. And so every single course, like you're racing against the clock and you only race it once and then they reset it. So you, you know, you see race car drivers or whatever, you see ski racers like leaning with their eyes closed, visualizing. And that became just a tool that I use so much in my skiing to know where everything is, but also like in my life, you know, because we all have those things where we're like, playing out a situation and playing out, okay, I'm going to say this thing to this person and then you're going to get really mad and then I'm going to say this, but then I'm like, well, what if we visualize it going the right way? Because if okay. we, especially for women, like if we visualize ourselves crashing or if we can't visualize ourselves doing like the line the whole way through, mm -hmm. you might, it might not be the right day to try it. Like it's for me, I have to be standing on top and be able to visualize the whole thing to completion. And it's a huge tool that I have and that I hone in my life and in my skiing in general. So anyways, that was kind of a visualization rant, but it's no, a I sick think tool. It's great. And I think it's like, I love getting into these um, mental talks about um, going into, because here's the reality, like uh, uh, not so much now, but there are inherent dangers in our job, right? There's like, there's inherent dangers of like, life or death situations where most people don't see, they see the fun. Oh, like you went to shred that slope. And it's just, it's like, it's a worldwide ski or snowboard vacation. Right. And the people don't understand like what's on the line per se. And so kind of a parallel that we had and we we're talking about is going to Alaska. I guess like as soon as you go to Alaska, like you step off the plane and you get there and it's just like, everything just tightens up. You're just like, you know, and there's just that overwhelming feel of like dread, but anticipation. And I don't think people really understand that. I can comprehend that from a movie of just like, it's like, it's like, it's a, it's like a cloud that follows you from like the amount of time you like go to Alaska. So you get off a plane and go back. And like one thing that I really wanted to like really emphasize about that, because again, I was watching your movies and it's super hilarious because these helicopters are dropping you off. And then like you pretty much turn and wave and like ah, dropping three, two, one, you know? And like, I wanted to explain to people like the dangers of what actually happens with that with toe-ins, right? Because most people don't know what toe-ins are. Toe-ins are when you're like on a mountain peak like this and then a helicopter comes in and it lands like right here, there and just hovers. So the skids aren't touching, right? And then you have to like get out and be like, okay, now I'm gonna go try and like go come down this mountain. It's a nice fin, right? And so there's so many things going on in that space. There's the rotor, rotor wash. There's the, you were actually talking about but before when I was doing it, you had to get things out of the basket. You have to get out of the chopper. You have to keep eye contact with the pilot to be like, because what happens is there's gusts. There's like gusts in the winds. And so the helicopter is constantly maintaining. So you have to watch the rotor so you don't get your head chopped off. And so between that, you're just trying to hold down all your gear while the helicopter is flying away, right? And like, it's mass anxiety. And so I wanted to talk about, because I know how I feel when I was doing it, like with camera gear and trying to get everything, I'm just like, oh my God, trying to get everything down and just keep calm, you know? And I just want to hear your experience of that, of like maybe how like meditation or just mental visualization or how you prepare for those kind of situations, because it's a, it's a tough mind game. Yeah, totally. I mean, cause it's really visceral. It's sort of like, I mean, it's the same experience before you have to have a really hard conversation with somebody and you have like a lot of anxiety and your nerves are going and there's like, you're trying to rehearse stuff, but there's also static and there's like just all of this stuff going on and nervous energy in your body. I mean, it actually feels really similar except for there's also that added awareness of like high consequence to your like body or, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so meditation has been a huge tool, but like, I just kind of wanted to, to spin off on like the heli drop off for a second because it's just so funny like 
it is so classic in the movies. You see us like holding our skis above our head for the hero shot or like waving, but like to get to that moment has been already pretty intense. And um, the I think I was asked one time in an interview, people are like, you know, what's your first thought when you're getting out of the heli or when the heli flies away? And I was like, do I have both my mittens? <laughs> because you're like, oh, scattered. <laughs> and it's like, like you don't go. And you're like, do I have all my things? But yeah, like when the, you have to be pretty much from when you get in the heli at the bottom, you've communicated your line to everybody. The cameramen know where you're going. Um, we take the doors off on the heli and we, you know, we're buckled in super tight mm -hmm. and we slide our skis in under our feet so that when the heli comes up, let's say this is like the knife edge ridge, the heli comes up, it rests a toe of its mm -hmm. rotor, which is why it's called a toe in, but it's pretty much in a full on hover. And so when you, just like you were saying, when you get out, you have to be really slow with your movements because your movements will actually kick the heli around. Wait, and a lot no. of times on these, yeah, on these ridge tops, there's not a lot of room, there's rocks around. So like it takes a really good pilot to do these complicated tow-ins and we get to work with some of the best and it's really awesome. But yeah. anyways, so yeah, you got to get down really gently and pull your skis out. A lot of times it's a really knifey ridge. So trying to pin your stuff down is hard. Yeah, and then everything, you know? Yeah, you got to lay on it. And yeah, like you said, keep contact with the pilot and also be ready to bolt in case something happens, like, you know, or move out of the way if the heli has to adjust or something. Yeah. So there's already a lot going on. And mm -hmm. I think that's why I was saying like, it starts when you get in the heli at the bottom is just stepping into this mental space yeah. where you can handle changes in the plan. Mm -hmm. And I, we like, I talk about this a lot, but that's where meditation helps me is because mm -hmm. we, a lot of us have this, like, or a lot of people have the misconception that meditating is sitting on a cushion and not thinking, which <laughs> could not be further from mm -hmm. the truth because we all think and we can't stop it. Mm -hmm. And so where meditation has really helped me is um, for me and for like a lot of mindfulness meditation, it's not about stopping the thoughts. It's about, mm -hmm honing your focus and your mm -hmm. awareness on something. It could be your breath. It could be sounds coming in. It can be anything you want to hone your attention on. And then when you notice yourself thinking, you catch it and you're like, okay, I was thinking and you come back to what you're focusing on. And so it's this constant refocus, refocus, refocus. It's noticing See, you're in thought and coming back. Because of my whole thing of that, it was, and I, and I, was, I wasn't meditating, and I'm not a meditator. Maybe I need to. Who knows? Possibly. But for me, it was like filtering out the noise. You know? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like, I've got this one purpose. Step here. Keep mm -hmm. Don't lose your snowboard off this side. Don't lose your camera pack over this side. How deep is the snow thing at that? Like, which way is the helicopter peeling off? And, like, when the helicopter would peel off, I'd be like, it was like the happiest I'd ever be with like seeing a helicopter leave. Because <laughs> like then you could just like stand and like pick everything back up again and like recalibrate. But literally yeah. that moment of just like filtering out the noise. So it's kind of like it's a parallel, but I mean I, I love hearing yeah. yours. So how about that and like when dropping into lines and doing like that, and like and, and I guess filtering the noise and the consequences and like looking at like, okay, this is where I'm gonna get through this. How's that work? Yeah, it's sort of at least for my process, mm -hmm. it's like I can't totally block the fear out because it's always going to be there. Um, and so my process is just like making friends with it and knowing that it's there and just being like, okay, cool. Fear is in my sphere. Like, yeah, like we're in the background, just like, like, like you know, <laughs> black cloak and like the, the <laughs> Her, yeah, yeah, exactly. like hanging out today. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, yo, homie, how's it going? Um, no, but I mean, there is like a very real, um, visceral acceptance of mm -hmm. like for me it's not a blocking out it's an accepting of everything that mm -hmm. it is all of the consequences and all of like all of it it's on my mind and i and i think about it and it's um to me it's like uh it's a dance with life you know i'm like mm -hmm. okay it, it that's when i'm more present than any time mm -hmm. and so on the same note, like, you know, once you drop in, that's usually when things are quite silent and it's nice mm -hmm. and you're just literally focused on the next turn or hitting that entry point. Mm -hmm. But on the same token, things don't always go according to plan. And so mm -hmm. it's like that same mental, it's like, tra you know, when I'm meditating, I'm training my subconscious to just return back to like return to focus, return to focus and getting off. I'm not like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, 
on the mat and also on the mountain you know it's like my subconscious quickly if something needs adjusting it's in my muscle memory it's in my, like all of my being where i'm just like oh okay need to do this and i it's not even a conscious thought and so i think that's for me why i credit a lot um to meditation is just having the awareness and having the presence but then also having like the mental and physical flexibility to just like roll with the punches because things don't usually go according to plan in skiing or in life. <laughs> no, for sure. And I think this kind of begs a deeper question and we're going to get a little bit personal here on that regard um, of just the, the impact of losing your, your fiance, you know, like boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah boyfriend. Sorry. Um, um, looking at that in that respect of just like how you went about coping and the aftermath of that, of like how you like went about as far as focusing and like still doing your line and then going on to life. Cause I have, I have my take on that with like what happened with my sister, but I'm curious to hear if it's something similar to, to what you went through in that respect. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I guess the first thing that I want to speak to on it is that, um, I like that experience for me was it was my first experience with death and what it made me realize is that like as a culture we never talk about it even though like mm -hmm. death and taxes are the only two certainties and change you know mm -hmm. so it really gave it started to give me a uh, a more conscious approach to like my own life and my own mortality and but just the choices that we make every day mm -hmm. So it, it started to open up this really beautiful door. And so, yeah, so he passed for anyone watching who, who hasn't heard the story. Um, in 2011, I think it was, uh, my boyfriend, Ryan Hawks, died in a ski competition that I was at. And so I, it was midway in the competition and he got flown to the ICU. And so I was faced with like a choice of, do I go sit while he's in induced a coma at the hospital bed or do I keep competing, you know? and I so deeply knew that if I couldn't talk with Ryan or support him, he would want me to like finish this competition because it was like a really, really important one. And I won't go into all the details, but anyways, I finished it and I was at the top and I was just like, this is for you, Ryan. And I'm just going to be as present as I can. I'm going to do it, do it for you. So I did it. I won. And then I drove straight to the hospital and he ended up passing away the next day. Mm -hmm. So then I decided to continue the competition circuit because because I knew that's what he wanted. And we have we have this thing when we're faced yeah. with really big life events, you're like, okay, how do I process grief? How do I allow that without sinking into the hole of feeling sorry for myself? And it's a really delicate dance. So for me, I was just walking that dance through the competitions, knowing with my North Star being like, what would Ryan want me to do during this time? Mm -hmm. So. So that was kind of a long spiel, but it really, that was when I started really asking myself like, okay, how do I want to live my life? Like I never really thought about it in the same way before. And, you know, when we're doing these sports, a lot of people are like, it's really selfish. It's super dangerous. You know, you can risk losing your life and then your family doesn't have you. And, you know, how do you grapple with all of that? And all of those questions are super valid. But I think the most valid question that you don't get asked, instead of like, is it worth dying for? It's what makes you live? What do you want to live for? What do you want to live for? Yeah, that is cool. like such an important question that I try and ask myself all the time. And I think a lot of us should be asking ourselves, you know? So that's the question I had to ask myself when my sister passed away. Wow. It, yeah. It one of those things where like, you know, I was like working in a ski town. I was doing... Partial, I was like photography half time and I was waiting tables. And then I came home and I quit my waiting job, my job waiting tables and got into photography because I was just like, it's interesting all of a sudden when death is this abstract thing. It's this abstract thing. Like it's over here, like that, it's never gonna touch me that. And all of a sudden it reaches down and it touches you. And all of a sudden you're like, oh man, like life can be taken from you any second. So you better mm -hmm. get to live in life. And it really changed the way that I came approach and trying to live life to the fullest and really trying to make things happen and really trying to achieve things and honestly believing in myself. And so that thing really like having that finite of like death come and tap me on the shoulder made me look at how I spend the rest of my world and what I'm trying to achieve and what I'm doing. And honestly, like just looking at this, just the speaker series that we're doing with the North Face, it's like 
look at the lives and things that we're touching and, and the things of driving and, and us believing in ourselves. I'm like, honestly, like, look here, virtual high five. Boom, right there. Boom. You know, like, that's pretty awesome. Look at what we're doing right now. So totally. it's one of those things of, of running towards life, you know? And rather oh, yeah. I love of, that. You know? And so yeah. it really made me look at how I want to go about running towards life and involving those people who, like, Maybe they haven't had that kind of experience of death, and I don't wish that on anyone because it's just sort of something that, like, it really, like, I don't know, screwed me up for years. I mean, probably still am. But, you know, it really, like, helped me help push other people towards living life, you mm -hmm. know? And so mm -hmm. they don't necessarily maybe know the reasons why, and maybe that's why I, like, did those films or produced those things or directed, you know, or got involved in these certain pieces because I saw something in these people or in these things or in this project that I wanted to run towards life and, and push people forward and, and show them what they could do and then also help them, you know, like, and like in the same way that people help me. So it's kind of like when you're talking about the snowmobile, it's like, it's like everyone starts somewhere, you know? And so mm -hmm. when you look at those things. It's like, you know, it's like, we're not going to be here forever. So it's like, what are you like? It's not what you're taking from the situation. It becomes more about what are you giving away? Mm. I know? really love that. You know? Yeah. Well, so for yeah. me now, I'm kind of at a point now in my life, like, I gotta make money. I gotta do it. I live in LA. LA is expensive. Okay. <laughs> I got bills to pay. But <laughs> in that equation, I'm definitely like looking at what I can give away. Mm -hmm. what I give away into this winter or outdoor or nature industry that I love and admire so much. What can mm -hmm. I give away? What knowledge can I share? What can I? get across and help people with because you know, like I'm not going to be here forever. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So yeah. Um, getting back to that, like our next thing is finding and exploring nature and art in strange places. And I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about like one, what nature means to you and kind of what you do on a daily basis or how you kind of go about bringing that into your life every day. Cause you're talking about like, you know, your secret spots. <laughs> secret, not so secret. Not so secret. <laughs> so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I guess one of like hearing you talk about, you know, giving away and what you're grateful for. Like, I think one of the things that I'm so grateful for that I was born into. I mean, besides like the incredible amount of privilege. I mean, my parents worked super hard, but I lived a super privileged life. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing that I'm so grateful for is my access to being outside. And so we were talking about it before, but um, I live at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon, just outside mm -hmm. of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And the Cory Trail is mm -hmm. this trail that like goes up the canyon right next to the creek, right by my house. And honestly, that is like the way that I incorporate nature into my life regularly is I just get to go outside mm -hmm. and it's right there. But it's also pretty accessible to the Salt Lake Valley. Like you can take public transit to right there and there's, you know, bouldering, there's trad climbing right outside there. There's like the creek to hang out by, you can mountain bike, you can trail run. And it's, I mean, it's right there and it's free. So I yeah. just, like, yeah. And it, to me, it's like such a reset, like, oh man, especially on these days with all the freaking Zoom life, like now you can't have a phone conversation, you have to have a Zoom conversation. And my eyeballs hurt being on the computer so much. And just being able to go outside and like look at like green That's trees green or that. snow, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like just, think of that. yeah. But I mean, even like in cities, in cities, there's ways to do that. Like I know you, would, I'll let you go well, into it more. It's funny because the parallel on that is I lived in Salt Lake, I lived in Sugar House, and so I would go and ride my bike up the Quarry Trail and like go and like you go like those like, little rock slides you can go swim in and stuff like that. And so pretty much when I kind of wrapped up my winter career for the main part in Salt Lake City, I moved to New York. And so getting there and being essentially kind of trapped in the city with a lack of nature and stuff, I found myself exploring. And I realized the other thing, how much those resets meant to me, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and stabilized and just brought me back to my center. And so yeah. I started looking at things that people could do and get outside of the city and so, or just be inspired by. It. And I found a couple things. Like the first thing that I was really inspired by in New York was like going to Storm King. So it's like an outdoor sculpture garden that you can walk through. It's about an hour north of 
New York. I'm like, you can play on the things, you can interact. There's these little like rock wall terraces and there's these overlook views. And it's just like, it's a very like visceral touching sensory thing where you can like play with the things. Obviously you probably wouldn't do that with now COVID because you probably catch something, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you can sit there and look at it and admire, you know, like it's just like these ginormous, I mean like these, some of these things are like three stories high, you know, like you can walk through them, you know? And so it's just like this big walking tour of these amazing art pieces that inspire you and, and, and like and revitalize you and like one of the things that I really want to see and I've been working kind of like on this speaker series with is trying to get more city and minorities and marginalized communities to be able to get outside and see these things and kind of like because it brings me peace it brings me calm right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so if it can do that for me and like I've been so fortunate by growing up in the outdoors then I think it would do it for other people right mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. me. and so mm -hmm. That's where my my heart's at nowadays. But the other thing that was really awesome is um, the MoMA PS One, right? So they have this museum that they would have like these like dance parties and like food and like interactive things. So you go through the museum and check out the different art pieces. They come out and get a snack and then come out like dance party. <laughs> and it was right next to. Um, Five Points, which I don't know if you know what that is, but it was like the big building that they had all the different graffiti um, all painted off from 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 the, the spray paint artists. So they actually just recently painted it all white, and it's a big lawsuit thing about that artist New York lands deal, whatever. But it was cool because you could walk through that and like see all the different arts on that. So just like in this place, you could go to one building over here and check out all the different graffiti art, and then you could go over here and check out the dance party and like literally curated museum with food and snacks and like just amazing, amazing people watching. Like it was just mm -hmm. like, Oh, but it was so inspiring that and I would, and I'd ride my bike there, you know, mm -hmm. living in mm -hmm. New York. So like I had these two different outlets of seeing that and kind of like grounding and reset and influence of people. So I think it's like, how do we like make that more aware for more people? And also like what's, what's essential to people's lives to actually having them reset and like become a little bit more grounded and seeing what's going on around them rather than just the buzz, buzz, buzz of like zoom calls and, and city life, you know, totally. there's, there's more out there, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's like something for me of like looking at like, how do we like, how do we bridge that gap to someplace where like you live and then someplace where I live and like, bring the parallels there of like having the same effect. Yeah. I think it's almost like that the first awareness that you have to have of that you could be feeling better, you know, mm -hmm. like sometimes it's so easy to get in these ruts or in these routines or something and not feel good or not even realize that you're not feeling good. But like, first you have to have the awareness of like, I could feel better and there's something that I can seek that I like, and and how do we make that accessible for more people? So the seeking isn't so hard, but like- well, I've got a quick question for you with that. Yeah. How do you recognize that? Um, usually it's, for me, I recognize it when I'm either overwhelmed or anxious. Those okay. are sort of my signature mm -hmm. emotions. Like mm -hmm. I can be going about my day, knocking off the to-do list, doing mm -hmm. everything, but there's like a certain level where all of a sudden I don't feel easeful or peaceful or chill. All of a sudden I'm like feeling anxious and overwhelmed. And that's my cue of like, okay, I need to do something to reset this. And sometimes it's exercise. Sometimes it's just like a walk in nature or sitting by a tree. Or if I'm like traveling in cities a lot, going to their parks and just being by trees, you know? And, um, Meditating doesn't always do it for me. Like getting out in nature or the other thing, like you were saying, is the stimulation of being around other people's creativity and other people's energy, which right now, oh, there's such a, that's like such a hole in our lives. Yes. But man, being around other people's creativity is like so rejuvenating for me. I mean, if we what watch another Instagram versus battle, I might lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for me, like, I know, like, usually by the end of, like, five days of working, like, being in office or something, I'm wound up. So, like, I just know that I'm, like, eh, I'm getting tight. And, then I, and I usually, like, go do something out in nature or I go ride my motorcycle. It's, like, my new thing now. Just, like, go out there and just get it out of my system and, like, come back and then that resets me. So I just, I've almost gauged it down to, like, 
once a week, like I got to go do something just to kind mm -hmm. of my, my equilibrium up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, I don't necessarily know if I have like that point or breaking point or what I know, but that's why I was actually curious if you knew when yours were, because I was like, if you can identify it, then we could actually like identify it and know when to actually try and counter it. So for me, it's like, I don't know necessarily when to, I haven't identified it. So like literally I was asking you a question goes like, okay, maybe I need to look at that and get some tips from you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, ideally I, it sounds like maybe what you're doing is staying ahead of the game, which is awesome. Like if I, incorporate re enough regular exercise or walk outside even if it's just a walk outside mm -hmm. i don't experience that as much you know mm -hmm. and so i don't know you might be like more ahead of the ball game and actually be in a good routine where you know what you need and you're getting ahead of it and yeah, i'm like i got to plan i got to plan my my nature and then i put it in my week you know yeah. like yeah. the day planner i'm like D -d 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 this this point this, this point, this, and I like, I make sure that I go do that. So it, it, it keeps me even, you know? Yeah, I know. Well, and it's like such an interesting time in our society where we're always being asked to be more productive. And a lot of times we'll sacrifice the, what feels like I'm superficial or super fun. I'm looking for more fun. I don't need to be like, I've been so productive this year. Like Stan needs a timeout. Like I'm good. <laughs> That's great though. I mean, this is why you are who you are, which is like a disruptor and a forward thinker, which is freaking awesome. Send me on vacation, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Of like, we're just being asked to be more productive. And so like the first thing that you'll cut out is like a walk outside or maybe like uh, taking a bath or just taking that chill time. And I think like now more than ever, especially with how intense this year has been, like just being able to say, this is enough. I've done enough. And I'm going to do this thing that sounds really nice for me. It's I know it's easy for me to say that, but. It's just really powerful. No, for sure. I think it's like, I think the interesting thing that I was actually talking to a friend of mine um, recently, and I think the whole thing about being stay at home, I think it's made people really actually like pay a little more attention to their actual health, like mm -hmm. what, you're eating, what you're intaking, what you're doing, and also your mental health, because now we have a lot of time with ourselves. Mm -hmm. or like we're filling up the time with things we're doing. And so it's interesting seeing this whole culture of like, I mean, like, the whole like Instagram fitness thing is just blown up. It's like crazy watching that. And then just seeing um, people's focus on health and wellness. And I, and I like that there's anything that's positive that probably has come out of the COVID. I think it's that just people like being aware of their bodies and being aware of their, their mental health. And then actually taking steps to kind of like go about countering that and like figuring like how to be in a better place. Um, which actually one of the, my next question for you is, you bought a boat. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> so that you like bought a boat. And I just was like, I'm so like curious because you know, like you've been this big mountain person and like in the mountains, in the mountains, in the mountains. And all of a sudden you're like about to go out there and just Gilligan's Island this thing. Like, I'm just like, what's up? You know, like how is that change in scenery? Like, how are you coping with that? Because it's like, it's a whole new world. It's a totally whole new world. Hey, it's like, it's so different, but it's also really similar. Um, okay. Like, yeah. I guess, so part of what ha makes it feel natural in some regards is just mm -hmm. the, like, I, and I've talked about this a lot on my Instagram, but yeah. just like, the power of mother nature and how yeah. she can just go like this to you so quickly and things change so fast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know how it is being in the mountains and being in Alaska and when storms come in and wind is moving snow around, it's like you're always watching and you're always paying attention mm -hmm. to certain environmental cues. And so Sorry, now going on that. So is it similar like to being back in Alaska? Is it like that kind of like, or it's <laughs> not the same intensity, at least yeah. what yeah. I've done so far. I okay. mean, Maybe when we set off on like my first like big passage, you know, yeah, and I'm out in the middle of the Atlantic, <laughs> my, I might be like, this is like Alaska, okay. but I haven't done that yet. Okay. But I'm actually really looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Cause I think it's a lot of the same ways that you grapple with it. But, okay. um, but this, what's scary about it is that mm -hmm. it's like, I know all of the ways in which I know the language of the mountains. I know the ways in which it communicates and when to back off and when mm -hmm. to have 
you know, like what to watch for. And I go to the ocean and I'm like, I know that I should be super respectful and I have no idea what I should be respecting, you know? So it's like, it's being in the beginner's mind all the time and like getting my stuff handed to me regularly. And oh my gosh, I hate it. I hate being a beginner. I just want to be good at everything right so away. On that in the perception, because like, I've been doing like a lot of like, just like lately, like water surf photography with my buddy JJ. Like we just, I go down to Encinitas cool. and I have this little water house and I'm like, I go swim around with fins and like people are so amazed. They're like, who's the black guy with fins? And I'm like, the underwater house, what's going on here? You know, like people are like, oh, it's, it's so funny. Um, but being in the water and swimming around, just the different sensations and the things that I see and like, um, and then that world, it's like, it's like landing on another planet. And so all the time it's like, being the beginner, and I know you're talking about how you hate being the beginner, but that, but also I love seeing it as this new world that I'm exploring, you know? So, mm -hmm. that, like, it's just like there's a joy in being like, of, of exploring something new, like, completely out of hand. Like, I'm like, I'm not walking, like, I'm paddling around in like these fins and I'm turning around in these waves. And just some of the photos we've got, they're just so surreal and trippy. So, I'm curious, like, how being a beginner and thing of that, how that affects you of like just seeing something new and, and inspiration. Mm. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of like when people talk about the best part about having kids is mm -hmm. you feel like you're rediscovering the world, you know, and just mm -hmm. the way that they're fascinated with a caterpillar or, mm -hmm. you know, seeing how things work in a new way. And sort of like that, it's like the, um, the childlike wonder is mm -hmm. like reinstilled when you go into something that's so amazing and so beautiful, like the ocean or, you know, this mm -hmm. underwater world. Mm -hmm. And it's so refreshing and time slows down, you know, mm -hmm. because you're taking everything in and it's mm -hmm. like a lot. And so it's like this really interesting juxtaposition of like being self-critical and frustrated with yourself because you want to be better, but then forcing yourself to drop the ego and just appreciate what's like all around, which I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds so cliche, but mm -hmm. things are cliche for a reason. And it's freaking awesome. And like, also the learning curve of being a beginner at something. And I think a lot of us like during this summer and this time have started trying new things, right? Cause we've had the time to be like, okay, well mm -hmm. either this isn't working or I have time for something new or maybe not. But the, that like experience of being new at something and having your first couple big breakthroughs or being like, I didn't know how to do that before. And like, now I know how to like read the wind and trim the sails mm -hmm. and know when to like, ease them out or whatever it is, that excitement of building a new skill set is like mm -hmm. just so great. It's been a while, you know, with skiing, like you're, you're, when you get really good at something, it's incremental mm -hmm. improvements. And then when you're a beginner, it's like, woo, woo, yeah. and you're like, oh, I'm crushing it. And then you get like smashed down and you make some dumb mistake. Like, mm -hmm. it was, I mean, like for one of the first days on the boat this summer, mm -hmm. I was trying to, um, catch the smooring with Pete mm -hmm. and you know, we have a 40 foot sailboat it's 25,000 mm -hmm. pounds doesn't slow down very fast and it's like driving a school bus on ice or something you know, and just <laughs> navigating it it's like hard it's like whoa I feel like you're riding a beluga uh -huh. and, uh, and I had to put it in reverse and I backed over the line that our dinghy was tied to and Round, wrapped around the prop, pulled the prop out of the engine. I mean, it was this whole, oh my, oh my gosh. And I mean, it just created problems for us all summer that we finally fixed. But it was like just one of those beginner mistakes that like hosed us all summer. But I learned a lot about how sailboat engines work and like the prop shaft and how it goes into the coupling. And I know that back of the engine really well. That's super so, fun because it's kind of same thing <laughs> with me. Like I was going out with JJ the other day and like he like casually goes and gets on the sports thing. And he's like, oh, be sure to shuffle around, watch out for stingrays. Think of that, like that. And I'm like, you're like pelling out, and I'm just like not thinking about it. And as I'm swimming out and I have my goggles, I'm like looking down and I'm like, you can see it. I'm like, oh, there's a stingray <laughs> over this way. You know, like, it's like that, like super simple things where you're just like underwater sea life that I just like don't normally deal with in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's just funny things where it's just like, it's super cool because I'm just like, yeah, if that thing stings you, you're going to swell up and it's going to like, be hard so things like that that are like just unaware in new parts of life so on that note like i think we pretty much kind of talked about getting back to happiness and looking at life and running towards life and and i just want to say thanks for joining me on the show it's been a really great pleasure 
talking to you and just getting to know you better. And also just thanks for all the people who had us on the show. I thank the North Face for having the speaker series. Um, you can see the whole season at the North Face YouTube channel. Also, there are a ton of people who helped us get the show going. Zena, Iram, Jamie, Sandra, Damon, Nicole, Kara, Kyle, and our guests, Austin, Conrad, Jeff, and of course yourself. So thank you all. It takes a village. And I don't know. I think we're on to something here. So thank everybody for coming to the show and tuning in. And Angel, hopefully see you out there in the water or in the mountains soon. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to everyone who is watching. And yeah, all the best. All right. Thank you. Have a great year. You too. Bye. Bye.